What's up Transformers enthusiasts, this is your boy RBG aka The Random Black Gamer hitting you guys up with another Transformers The Last Night related video. First and foremost I want to give a big thank you for all the love and support you guys gave me on the previous video. That video has been getting a lot of shares and it wouldn't be possible without the supporters, even the haters for the most part, because I want to provoke viewers to inform me on things I might have missed out on even if it comes with a barrage of insults. Just remember that if you're going to back your claims up with insults, make sure they're actually factual because you'll most likely have your ass handed to you by yours truly. With that said, let's get on with the topic at hand. For today's video, we're going to be talking about the second in command of the Autobots, Bumblebee, and his spin-off solo film. I'll also be giving out info on the newly announced CG animated Transformers 1 film and give thoughts on what we may or may not see going forward. So earlier this year in February, Paramount announced that they would be expanding the Transformers universe and would be releasing three movies annually in June. This news came as a big surprise for lovers of the Bay films and for people who flat out hate them. I mean, let's be real, we can't deny that we don't see the big elephant in the room here folks. Ever since TF2 Revenge of the Fallen suffered a huge blow from the 2008 writer's strike, the films have never been the same, at least in terms of story. I mean, you could argue that the films have only been more successful since then based on the last two films grossing over a billion dollars worldwide, but if you base that on the domestic grossings, you can see an obvious decline in actual interest in the product. But there's no need to worry because Paramount does see this and wants to make sure they want to do more than just please the Eastern audience such as China. They're actually trying to rebuild from the ground up and keep from ostracizing their Western audience, and boy do they really mean business. Paramount and Hasbro have teamed up to bring us a new prestigious group of writers to work on the future Transformers films. Now we pretty much know that Hasbro will always have an involvement with the live action movies since it is their product being brought to the silver screen and their toy sales hinge on the robots being seen worldwide, but this is a more personal matter for them and Paramount. The writers assigned to these films will have access to Hasbro's vault of toys and all their other TF lore you can think of. I'm talking DVDs, comics, all the works. From there, the writers will draw inspirations from all the various sources and culminate them in their expanded cinematic universe. Now I don't know about you guys, but I would kill to be locked in a room with all the Transformers toys. There's gotta be so many prototypes that Hasbro and Takara have yet to unveil in their sanctuary that they call an office. But this is big news for the future film installments because as we all know, the TF universe is a vast one. Just covering the Autobots and Decepticon story alone would give the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings films a run for their money, at least in terms of length of course. Now it may still seem like fans should still be worried for the film series because we still don't know how well they'll utilize all those elements that have been laid out for them, but judging from some of the catalogs on the films these writers have worked on, I can say the future looks bright, but before we delve into the future films, let's talk about the film we have right now. Since the name is in the title, let's actually talk about TF5 The Last Night. Now the reason I'm actually equating this film with the new writers is because three of them are actually linked to it, those three writers being Art Markham, Matt Holloway and Ken Nolan. These guys have written and done screenplay for some big films in the past. Art Markham and Matt Holloway are more of a screenwriting duo, so we're gonna instantly have the power of two going into TF5. They're best known for writing the script for the first Iron Man film that actually kicked off the now billion dollar franchise Marvel Cinematic Universe, and they also screen wrote for Pornister Warzone, a movie that was not so praised for its story, but it was praised for its highly grotesque bloody action sequences. And our third writer, Ken Nolan, has screenwritten for the Academy Award winning film Black Hawk Down. He's actually replacing Bay's previous writer, Aaron Kruger, who wrote Dark of the Moon and Age of Extinction. So we're talking about some heavy hitting guys when it comes to the box office. And you can't go wrong with a director who has an Academy Award under his belt. But it doesn't stop there because we have two top tier writers to go. We also have the new head commander of the new writers division, Akiva Goldsman. In June 2015, Paramount announced that he would be leading the writing team to create the multi-film cinematic universe, so I'm guessing that he had a hand in picking the three writers I mentioned earlier. He's written for the Oscar award winning film A Beautiful Mind and also written for the Da Vinci Code film adaptation. Next writer we have is Jeff Pickner. He probably has the weakest resume out of all the writers. He's one of the brains behind the poorly received Amazing Spider-Man 2, but I'm thinking he was probably handpicked by Akiva Goldsman himself because they both wrote for the Fox series Fringe. Now there are a lot of names in the TF cinematic universe of writers, so I'm not going to go into details and name all of them, but I am going to name off some projects they were and still now associated with in terms of actual screenwriting. 
we have a guy who's worked on the Incredible Hulk film, a film that wasn't really a big smash at the box office, but it gave a good idea of what the Hulk should look like on the silver screen compared to the first movie. We even have a writer who's no stranger to giant robots. He's written for Pacific Rim and he was one of the head writers for the Netflix series Daredevil. There's a ton of more writers but I don't want to make this video too beefy. I just want to show you guys that there is a little bit of hope for the direction of the films going forward. What I really want to get into is the meaty part of this video and that is what I think the Bumblebee spinoff and Transformers 1 CG animated films plot and overall looks will consist of. I had mentioned in my previous video that it was obvious that Bumblebee wouldn't be dying at the hands of Optimus because it was quote unquote rumored that he has a spinoff movie coming out. To that you guys literally flamed me which is well warranted because that actually wasn't a rumor it was officially confirmed earlier this year so I apologize on that part. So my bad on my poor choice of wording but with that said there's still a chance that B will still survive because he's literally the second in command of Optimus. And I'm not just talking on the big screen, I'm talking about in terms of toy sales. That's a good enough reason to corroborate the theory that he'll most likely survive in TF5. But if he does in fact die, that doesn't mean we won't be seeing more of him in future films. It's recently been confirmed that his solo film will be a prequel or origin story of some sort. Earlier this year in February, Hasbro chairman Brian Goldner announced new details about the next three films in the TF franchise. It's pretty much the same thing I already stated about Hasbro and Paramount teaming up to expand the universe, but the eyebrow raiser I noticed was how he described the Bumblebee solo film. He says, and I quote, on June 8, 2018, a new film is being developed which will tell the never before heard story of Bumblebee, one of the most beloved characters from Hasbro's Transformer universe. I don't know about you guys, but when I see the words never before I heard story, I'm thinking an origin story. And when I think of B's origins, a lot of questions come to mind. When did he land on Earth? And exactly what caused him to damage his vocal processors? However, these are questions that have somewhat been answered for me already in the comics based on the live action films. Back in March, I made a video on the origins of the Movieverse version of Optimus Prime from the IDW comics. Now these comics aren't really considered the official canon backstory for the Autobots and Decepticons from the films, but since they were tightly supervised by Hasbro and Paramount, they give a good general consensus on some of the questions fans have regarding what happened before the events of the first 07 film. They even filled in the blanks of what happened in between each film and fleshed out the backstory of more prominent characters such as the Fallen and Sentinel Prime. The comics may not be official canon, but I do believe that Paramount will be using some of the elements that have been laid out. I mean if you look at it, the overall aesthetic of the Bayformers transferred over to the comics quite nicely. The designs of all the robots stay true to their movie counterparts even though they were somewhat stripped down to their original Cybertronian skins. This leads me to one of the main things that the Bumblebee and Transformers 1 CG movie will be utilizing from the IDW comics, and that is protoforms. Now you're probably asking yourself what is a protoform, because that word rarely gets used nowadays in the Transformers mythos. Protoforms are essentially the endoskeleton of all the Transformers. Now in order for me to fully explain what these endoskeleton systems are, I have to take you back to where they originally originated, and that's the Transformers Beast Wars series. In Beast Wars, protoforms were like the neutral stage of the Transformers. It's pretty much the first stage of a Transformers life cycle, similar to a human embryo being more along the lines of a liquid substance. Protoforms consisted of an unspecified metallic matter layered over the basic robotic systems. This metal wields the ability to repair itself at a rapid rate even after receiving extreme damages. Now Michael Bay went out of his way to use these elements in his movie verse, but it's somewhat expanded upon and changed in certain ways. In the first film, US Air Force officials discovered that the metallic alloy was what they described as a self-regenerating molecular armor after examining Scorpionox's tail. So it has been established that that metal has the ability to heal, even if it's been hit by something that can melt tank armor. But that particular metal never had a specific name in the other Transformers mythos. It would sometimes go by Proto Matter, but that was it. But Michael Bay and his writers would later give it the name in Age of Extinction. Thanks in part to the Kinetic Solutions Incorporated, aka KSI, they've given the metal the name Transformium. A name that's kind of weird and cliche, but you get used to it. But anyways. As we learn, Transformium has the ability to reconfigure its molecules to assume any shape or color it wants. With this, the Transformers can pick and choose their alternate modes. Now even though Transformium is the coined term of the films, I'm still going to use the term Protoforms. Although the film established certain things, it's still Hasbro that gets the last say in what they want to name their toys. 
In 2007, they released a deluxe class Optimus Prime figure based off the IDW movie prequel comics. They titled the toy Protoform Optimus. They released similar figures for Starscream and Bumblebee too. Now, presumably, these designs were Hasbro's only reference for a Cybertronian look for all the Transformers. I mean, for the most part, the films show these forms and we see a lot of Decepticons walking around in protoform when they invade Earth, but the designs make the Transformers look unrecognizable. They were relatively skinny and don't have that many distinctive differences. What I love about the movie-based comic protoforms is how they use iconic traits and colors for each character so the readers can easily distinguish who they are. For example, although Optimus is mainly covered in blue instead of the red and blue in the Transformers Defiance comics, you can still tell it's him based on the windshield-like Cybertronian chest plates and iconic helmet, and Bumblebee and the rest of the crew still have their original colors. Even though the movie version of Protoforms lack color, it would be wise if they added in the iconic colors for the Beast spinoff in Transformers 1 CG film. Since both films will be mostly on Cybertron, you're probably thinking that it's gonna kill Paramount's budget with all that CGI, right? But in my honest opinion, it'll be a lot easier for them to balance their spendings. One of the main reasons why fans don't see their favorite Transformers take on their classic vehicle modes in color is simply because Michael Bay has to stay within the budget when purchasing all the different cars. This is why characters like Crosshairs and Drift don't really mirror their original versions in terms of color, because the manufacturers only sell those cars in a specific color pattern. And this is one of the main reasons why a lot of cool Autobots like Sideswipe and Dino disappear because they just can't afford to have those cars in every movie, especially when they're adding on different other Autobots who had to have alternate modes. It also explains why they used a Pontiac as Jazz's alt mode instead of a Porsche 911. What's even more straining for them is that they have to buy two of the same vehicles, one being for stunts and the other for close-up shots. And these cars range from $500,000 a pop. But since they will be dealing mainly with the Cybertron, they won't have to worry about their budget going towards any big name vehicles. This leads us to the ultimate question, just what are they going to transform into if they don't have any vehicles to scan? Well, if you go back to the first Bay film, you pretty much have your answer. When the Autobots came to Earth, they showed up in these metal comet shaped like pods. Their protoforms were pretty much wrapped in these pods and once they landed, they would uncoil from them. Those are the actual alt modes the Cybertronians used before they scan actual cars. There was no official name for the alt mode, but Hasbro came out with a protoform Optimus toy that could transform into his alt mode. It's called Transscanning Optimus Prime. These alternate modes can be seen in the movie comics as well. They look like the alien comet rocks on wheels. This is an element that we may see used again in the newer films. And I think the method may be easier to design since the animation teams don't have to worry about integrating car parts this time around. We've pretty much seen Cybertronian vehicle modes in video games like the War for Cybertron and the Fall of Cybertron games, which is kind of funny because those particular games combined the Bay Films designs with the G1's designs and made it their own. But moving on, there's still no talk on what the plots will consist of, but I'm hoping that we get more intel on the Allspark. We get a little backstory on it in the comics. It was basically used to restore life to a dried out Cybertron, but there's still no official origin for that. As far as Bumblebee is concerned, I've read a little on what he was up to on Cybertron. He was basically a guard who worked alongside Cliffjumper at this temple to guard the Allspark. His voice box was destroyed by Megatron during a fight for the Allspark. Sounds very similar to what we saw with the Transformers Prime series, which also borrows heavy from the Bayformers. But this is an opportunity for us to actually have more Transformers because like I said, we don't have to worry about the budget this time anymore. We don't have to worry about big name brands, you know, having to fork out the cash. We can have a huge ensemble of Transformers for Autobots and the Decepticons. And one thing that these movies really lack is actual back and forth banter. Like we don't really see a lot of conflict within the Autobots team or headquarters. We could see more of that. But anyways, that's all I have for you guys today. What are you expecting to see in the future films? Are you optimistic for the films based off the info we got regarding the new writers? Let me know in the comment box below. I also ask that you like or dislike the video for any feedback is always good feedback and it'll only help elevate the channel. And if you're interested in the new movie or just like watching Transformers related videos in general, then by all means subscribe. But like always, this is your boy RBG signing out on another video. Hope you guys have a happy new years and don't forget till all gamers are one. See you guys next time. Peace out.